Yeah. Uh, some of the an update on some of the ministry where we're at. Um, it's Christmas time, yes. and uh, it's been churches reaching out and uh, providing us uh, uh, dinners and lunches and gifts for these kids to see these kids light up. Uh, it's been absolutely amazing to see and experience it. Uh, we had three Christmas parties uh, last week, and uh, each and every one of them enjoyed it. We had a ride that showed up, uh, a biker ride, and they brought all these motorcycles into this campus. And uh, they had a truckload of stuff. They came out there and uh, saw all those kids just slotting just slotting up with uh, opening their gifts and stuff. It's been absolutely amazing <laughs> to see. Um, and it's just, it's, it's a lot of fun. It really is. Um, those kids stay with you even when you're off the shift. So um, it's, a, it's a really a blessing. God's really showing us some stuff there. I apologize, my voice is a little out. If I start reaching for the reaching, so just uh, bear with it and we'll see if we can get through it. So you're my all in all. doing the live stream tonight but we are recording so that could be uploaded later possibly if it works out well enough on the volume and the voice and everything like that but uh, uh, we are turning our, and looking in the scriptures tonight to St. John 15 our second Wednesday night in this chapter as we continue on with what we have been teaching of course in this gospel of John and showing how that uh, what Jesus gave in St. John 15 verse 1 was the seventh of the seven I am statements that the Lord uh, gave uh, while he was here on the earth. He gave seven different I am statements. And this one is, of course, I am the true vine. You'll notice verse number one, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. And we spoke about that last week, of course, and began to talk about Jesus saying that he was the true vine. He is the true source, of course, for our lives, for the believer's lives. And, and of course, we can uh, 
look at some of the things that have to do with the vine, historically speaking, looking back to the Old Testament, various other scriptures. Last week we put a lot of our emphasis in our teaching about abiding in him, which means, of course, to draw upon his strength and to allow ourselves uh, uh, the wonderful opportunity to have his life to come into our lives, his strength, his blessing upon our lives. There is such an inner blessedness in being born again and cultivating fellowship with God that we want everybody to know what it is to be blessed that way, to have that inner blessedness, that assurance. We've talked a good bit about assurance in recent weeks, talking about how that Jesus, uh, just hours before he's to be crucified, he's providing such great assurance for his disciples. And he's given them so many things to help them, not only for that period of time, but for every thing that they're going to face from that point on. He's equipping them with Bible knowledge, of course, and giving them a teaching about the Holy Spirit that's going to benefit and bless them no matter what nation they wind up in, no matter what circumstance they're facing. From that point on, they're going to have this built into them. They're going to have this knowledge that Christ is uh, the true vine that they can draw on his strength. The temptation is, of course, to just try to do things on our own and within human strength and human cleverness. And they're going to be tempted just as uh, every other Christian has been tempted to just try to live on their own strength and their own cleverness, their own intelligence. Amen. And God wants us to use what he's given us, but also there are things that we're going to face that's going to take more than what we have within ourselves. That only the Lord can provide what Amen. we need uh, to put us over. And I believe that's one reason we have a lot of stress sometimes in the body of Christ because people are looking for something in people that can only be found in God. Amen. And so we're encouraging people to have their own fellowship with God. To abide, of course, has to do with a wonderful fellowship that's cultivated between the person and the Heavenly Father, the child of God and the Heavenly Father through devotion, through prayer, through scripture reading, through so many things that God has given us, wonderful gifts of devotion that God's given us and praise and worship, these things cause us uh, to see the reality of the scriptures uh, begin to work in our lives. And we encourage it so much. We want folks to have a wonderful devotional life. And you'll notice, of course, that if you read through the Bible, that you're going to find that vineyards was very much a prevalent thing in the nation of Israel. Even the temple that was built had what is called a golden gilded uh, vineyard or vine that was actually uh, carved into the side of the temple all the way around. Herod's temple uh, had the actual vine, uh, the image of that, carved into the temple. And they, uh, oftentimes that means that they would also uh, cause it to be gilded, which means that they painted it with like a gold paint or, or they put a gold surface on uh, that vine. So much a part of uh, their nation's history. And of course, God looked at Israel as being like a vineyard in many ways and we have scriptures about that where God refers to them uh, as a vineyard and of course he says to them that they become an unfruitful vine so you're going to have three different vines in scripture primarily you're going to have Jesus who's the true vine and then you've got Israel Jeremiah 2 21 says yet I have planted thee a noble vine holy a right seed how then art thou turned into the degenerate plant of a strange vine unto me God ordained that Israel would bear fruit, that they would be a witness nation, and that they would influence the other nations with the glory of God and the fame of his name. The essence of God's name was to be seen in the lives of, of Israelites and would cause other nations to know that there is a very different kind of God in Israel rather than the God that, that had been made by man. This is the God that made man. Can you say amen? And that differential was to be seen through the lives of the Israelites. And of course, when they got away from God, they couldn't bear fruit. They lost their source in so many ways. They had that broken fellowship with God. They were in a very strange place spiritually. And as a result of it, they could not bring forth the fruit that God had ordained. And we have a time right now when it seems like there's a lot of Christian people are in a strange a place spiritually where they are broken off in their fellowship from God. They are not able to produce the fruit that the Word of God uh, teaches about. And of course, uh, in history, as we said, Israel uh, was considered by God to be a vine. And of course, uh, he says to them in Isaiah chapter 5, What more could I have done to be able to have the vine to be fruitful? What more could I have done? I did everything that a vine dresser could do. And Jesus said, I am the true vine, but my father is the husband. 
And so he's the vine dresser. And of course, a vine dresser is going to prune. He's going to do whatever necessary to make it worry that that vine will bring forth fruit. And of course, uh, sometimes with the pruning process, it hurts, but it also helps. Amen. Amen. And that's the way it is when the Word of God goes forth in our lives. It seems like all the time, you know, the Lord lets me know there's areas where I can come along in and I'm experiencing the pruning of the sharp two-edged sword of the Word of God. And uh, sometimes even things that you think was well, pretty good, things that are, you know, seem good and some things they even seem better, but then the Lord is, he'll cut away some of those things so you can have the best. Amen. He's out for us to increase not only the quantity of our fruit, but the quality of our fruit. And so Jesus gives this right in the middle of his teaching. Here he's on the, uh, the Thursday night uh, before the crucifixion. This is Thursday of Holy Week, the week of Passion, of course. This is the Thursday. It's getting pretty late down in the week. But this is his teaching to his disciples. He could have taught them a thousand different things. Of course, he's God, and he could teach them so many different things. But at a time like this, this is the teaching, that you must abide in me. Eleven times he tells them, or uses some version of the word abide. Sometimes it's interpreted as remain or continue. But eleven times he's using the word abide here in the first eleven verses, I think it is. I mean, that must be a theme. That must be a great thought to it when he says, abide in me. Amen. And he says, verse number two, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. He's talking about the vitality of the believer. He's working with the believer to become more fruitful, to become more vital, to be stronger uh, in their Christian lives and Christian testimony. Verse number four, abide in me. He said, you're already clean through the word which I've spoken to you. Verse three, then abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. Now the Bible tells us there's coming a future day where there's going to be another vine. The book of Revelation 14 chapter says the vine of the earth. Now that means that a lot of people are going to be drawing their strength and drawing whatever it is in their life from this world system. It's shown there in the book of Revelation uh, to teach us how that many people are going to look to the world and the flesh and they're going to look to human intelligence and cleverness as we mentioned before. Many people are going to draw their lives out of this world system. Of course, they're going to be horribly disappointed because ultimately all that's going to bear forth is the fruit that leads to wrath and to Amen. judgment. Isn't that true? Amen. So everybody's making a choice every day. We're either going to draw on the strength of the Lord Jesus Christ, put your dependence on the Word of God, or you're going to have to or you'll wind up putting your dependence on the things of the world. Yes. And in the book of Revelation, all this culminates. It comes to a head. It is the final act, you might say. And the Lord, of course, is bringing everything down to that point. And, of course, just as the church is to be preparing for the coming of the Lord, the world is preparing for the coming of the Antichrist. Yeah. They don't know it. They don't realize it. They've had already had a bunch of Antichrists in the past, but they had not had the Antichrist. Amen. They've had a lot of forerunners. They've had a lot of Hitlers and Hamans. They've had a lot of uh, other uh, people that have been murderous and all different types of people who've been antichrist in the past. And all of that was a sign of what is to come. And just as it was when Jesus was here on the earth, there was already that antichrist spirit. Some people are willing to draw their life from the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul the Apostle said, for me to live is Christ. But then there are others that are drawing everything out of this world, that they are completely representative of what the spirit of the world that's out there. The Bible says they're in the embrace of the wicked one. Their whole lives are built on and established on uh, the teaching and the philosophy of this world system, which is a failed system. It is alarming, you know, when I interview people, how many people in our country that want to go along with socialism? Even though, you know, they tell us how many Tens of millions and possibly hundreds of millions of people died because of socialistic ideas in the 20th century. But now we've got college students, people, young people all across this nation. If you ask them, what would you rather have, socialism or capitalism? And they'll say, well, I'd rather have socialism so everybody can have the same. Everybody have a fair chance. So you tell them, you know, on college campuses, they'll ask them. They say, well, let's take your grade point average and share it with the people whose grades are not as good. They didn't earn as good a grade as you did. Let's take that. And they say, oh, no, no, no. Wait a minute. <laughs> I don't think I want to do that. The thing of it is the socialism, communism, and those type of things 
or a godless type of philosophy. Amen. They don't have any type of uh, thing to honor God in the midst of that. Capitalism, of course, can be just as sinful in some ways with the materialism and the love of money. The Bible teaches is the root of all evil. Sometimes even in the church, people say it's not the love of money, it's the root of all evil, it's the lack of money. I used to, used to be a man on television when I was just coming up early in the ministry. He'd get on there and preach that. And he'd laugh a little bit like it's a joke. But then when you saw his lifestyle and everything else, you realize that's what he really believed. He believed that the lack of money was the root of all evil, not the love of money. So you can get in trouble with any of these things. But it's obvious, brethren, that people are drawing their strength and their wisdom. Their wisdom is not uh, from above. It's from beneath. It's from the earth. It's sensual and devilish, uh, a kind of wisdom that's a perverted wisdom. And that's what the Bible says about Satan, that his wisdom will be perverted. And many people are drawing their wisdom that way. If the church is not careful, it will begin to try to draw from this world system and try to get along with the world uh, to an extreme. I mean, we ought to be the most loving people on the planet, but at the same time, we cannot compromise with those things that God has clearly told us as an abomination unto him. Isn't that true? And so uh, it's a challenging thing to draw your strength from and put all your dependence on God, but we will do so much better uh, if we would. Isn't that right? Well, we put a lot of emphasis last time on abiding in Him, and it would be quite all right to do that, uh, certainly, but we want to go a little bit further and over into some of these other verses because you'll notice uh, that He says to them uh, and talks to them about friendship and the love of God. You'll notice verse number 13, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. And of course, the Lord Jesus Christ begins to talk to his disciples about the fact that they are his friends. And of course, they being his friends, they are in the inner circle. That's really what friend means in this particular situation. They're part of that inner circle. They know things that other people are not going to know. They're having experiences with the Lord that other people have not yet had. And so they are his friends, but at the same time, he says to them, to, they are to be slaves. I mean, this is a tremendous paradox that on one hand, he said, you're to be my slaves. Well, we say servants. The King James Bible says servants. But did you know that there are ministers out there who say that this was a tremendous cover-up, that even in the interpretation and translation of the King James Bible, a lot of times where the word in the Greek said slave, they put servant. Because, of course, they despise... Uh, 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 the idea of slavery, of course, we despise it. We understand how horrible uh, that uh, slavery can be. Uh, but the dynamic that it has to do with our relationship with the Lord is that he claims our lives as his own, that he's bought and paid for us. Amen. I mean, those slaves were, were bought and paid for. Isn't that right? Once you become a slave, you don't have any agenda of your own from that point on. Can't imagine if you was a slave, you get up in the morning, you start telling the owner, this, this is what I think I'll do today. That's not how it works. Amen. And the Lord talks to him in this chapter, you know, that I am your Lord and Master. Actually, in chapter 13, he says, you know, I am your Lord and your Master. I don't know if he's our Lord and our Master. That means we are his slave, not just his servant. See, that servant, that kind of softens the blow some, makes it sound like, well, I can just come along, serve the Lord a little bit, serve a little here, a little there, and that's, that's going to kind of take care of it. But that's not what he asked for us. He asked for us to be friends, that we would have close fellowship with him, we'd abide in him, and we'd know things that others did not know, that others had not yet experienced. But he also claimed our lives, he put a claim on our lives of slavery, that we're supposed to be totally devoted to him in everything. I mean, that's a little challenging, isn't that right? <laughs> that provides some conviction to it. Instead of just laying out all your own agenda, I mean, oh, the Lord is the one who's supposed to be laying everything out for us. You've been bought with a price, so therefore glorify God in your spirit and your body. Well, I'm telling you, that's a teaching that will take root and that begin to bear some fruit in us if we will allow it to. Amen. Which means, of course, we just can't do anything we want to do. That God has called us uh, to live a very different kind of life. A life where we are actual friends of the Lord, of course. And that we realize that we are no longer calling the shots. And that's why, you know, sometimes this thing's not so popular. It doesn't surprise me that people don't just uh, uh, come in by the dozens and what have you a lot of times because what we're actually calling on people to do is to come and die. Yeah. And to die to themselves, die to their own aspirations. Hello? Amen. 
And that's a very different message than a lot of what we hear. Most of the message we hear, you know, is, uh, is to come and, uh, and then you can live your best life. You can get what you want. You can, uh, uh, you know, if you'll come to God or whatever, then you can just be self-fulfilled. You can get whatever you want. But that really wasn't the message in the beginning. The message in the beginning was, of course, take up your cross and follow me. Amen. Become my slave. Yeah. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. It says in the King James Bible, but it should have been interpreted, well done, thou good and faithful slave. Anybody out there? <laughs> See, we've sanitized that and shaped it a little bit. Somebody said, even with the Bible translation, even with the Bible translation, it happens. Because they, of course, uh, you know, they did it honestly, probably to some degree, but they, uh, they're trying to avoid this concept of that of a slave. But the Lord wasn't trying to avoid it. <laughs> You know, he was trying to let you know this is how far reaching it is that if you've had to be redeemed, if you've had to be bought, it's like the teaching of the kinsman redeemer in the Old Testament, that if you've been redeemed, then you're no longer uh, your own person, that you've uh, title deed to your life has been passed over to somebody else. If you read the book of Ruth, of course, and understand what happened with Ruth and Naomi and the kinsman redeemer, you realize they... Uh, Something's been done here that uh, causes us to no longer be in control of our lives. And of course, if we really knew uh, what the Lord had for us, we'd be glad to give up control. And we would understand being a slave to the Lord God and the Lord Jesus Christ is the ultimate in being free. Amen. Somebody said we ought not seek our freedom so much as we ought to be very careful about who's going to be our master. Because if you choose the right master, I mean, that's even better than just being completely free. Because as we said last week, uh, that to be completely free means that you're on your own. Yeah. Like, like one fellow said, butterflies are free, but they can't fly out of space. They can't just go and fly up to the moon. They won't make it. <laughs> Isn't that right? They've got to be restricted. Of course, that's what a lot of t-shirts say, butterflies are free. And people just... They're just floating around, whatever the wind carries them, whatever it is. But they're just doing their own thing, or they think they are. But the Bible says, actually, they're walking according to the course of this world. They think they're just doing their own thing. They say, hey, we're free, but they're not really free. They're actually enslaved by the wicked one. So you've got to figure out who's going to be your master. Either you're going to bow your knee to this world system and to the God of this world, or you're going to bow your knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let him be your master. I mean, the Bible wouldn't call him the Lord uh, unless there's uh, something going on when it comes to your life that he's got something to say about your life. He's Lord, then he's got something to say about where you go, the things you do. Are you out there? <laughs> and this is not a popular teaching. I realize it can get awfully, awfully quiet when you start talking about this level of commitment, what have you. But this is where our folks can get some deliverance. This is where they get free. I mean, a lot of folks are just wore themselves out trying to direct their own lives. And the Bible says it's not even within man to be able to direct his own steps. You don't. You just don't have it. I used to get a little aggravated when they'd sing that song and said, you know, I can't even walk without you holding my hand. But then finally I got into situations letting me know I can't even walk <laughs> without you holding my hand. No use getting mad about it. It's just the honest God's truth. <laughs> That's how dependent you are. You know, you think, hey, I'm going to pick myself up by my bootstraps. I'm going to, I'm going to do what, uh, uh, whatever it takes to help get myself through. But come to find out, you, you can come to the end of yourself very quickly. All of a sudden you realize you don't have any resources of your own. So you're going to have to draw on some other resources. And a lot of folks are just looking into spiritual things. They're not careful about whether or not they're looking for biblical things. So they're just uh, looking out into the realm of the supernatural. That's why they fall into false teachings and strange practices and what have you. And some folks have pretty much exhausted that realm, according to them, that they've looked into the supernatural realm. And they said, well, you know, I'm still not. Uh, certainly they've looked into the natural realm and they've exhausted that a lot of times. So that's why they turned over to the supernatural realm, but then because of uh, not going by the Bible, they get into things that are really very deceptive and uh, just causes even more bondage. The Bible said there are those who promise freedom and preach freedom and promise freedom, but then when people get involved with it, their last state is worse than their first. They become just hopelessly bound unless the Lord set them free, they become in a tremendous bondage. So think about this paradox the Lord is saying to them on one hand, you're my friends, 
So I'm going to talk to you in ways I wouldn't talk to others. On, and also, though, you're my slave. <laughs> But uh, the Lord gives us these different teachings, of course. He gave them the teaching about the bridegroom. He gave them the teaching of, uh, of course, the branch and the imagery there. He gave them uh, the imagery of friendship. All these different things he gave them. I wanted to read you a couple of things about that. I already skipped over it. But I wanted to mention to you something that I got from uh, Dr. Wearsby. He says that when Jesus used the picture of the friend, that... That idea that these two pictures of the believer being branches and friends reveal both our privileges and our responsibilities. As branches, we have the privilege of sharing his life and the responsibility of abiding. As friends, we have the, pro the privilege of knowing his will and the responsibility of obeying. I mean, all of this teaching that Jesus has been giving them is to help them to be able to obey him, that whenever he's... Uh, exalted to the throne of God that he's away from them and he's out of sight will they continue to obey him and he's given them of course uh, such tremendous teaching so they'll have the capacity to obey of course he's calling on them to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature they're to go forth and be a witness uh, through the whole world wherever they wherever they have opportunity I mean that's no small challenge well, I'm here to tell you that uh, the teaching Christ gave them is greater than any of the opposition they're going to face. This teaching that he's the vine, the true vine, there's a lot of vines, a lot of things that will offer some type of source to you of strength and life, but Jesus is the true vine. You see how he said that? I am the true vine. It's going to be a temptation to draw on things that are false and not right, things that are going to disappear over a period of time. I thank God there are some things that are eternal. Glory to God. He is the true vine. He's going to outlast anything that this world has. Yes. I was reading the story where a man was in the, the ministry preaching the gospel. And he came home one day and found a note. And his wife left and took their child. And uh, said that she couldn't live that life that he was living. She wanted to go for the bright lights, she said. And I mean, no, people don't always come just say it out loud like she did, but that's what people are doing. They're going out there for the excitement, the bright lights of this world. But I mean, no, in every situation where there's bright lights like that, eventually the lights are going to go out. Amen. <laughs> there's only one light that never goes out. Can amen. you say amen? Finally, that she got in such bad shape and she got a hold of her husband somehow to come and talk to her before she died. She got into so many things, so many sinful things, whatever that. Uh, she come down to the point where she's going to die, and he's able to help her before she died. And he's the one that wrote the song, No One Ever Cared For Me Like Jesus. Can you say amen? amen? And brethren, nobody has ever provided for us and give us sustenance and give us the ability to, to be sustained. He is the vine. He's the one that's providing the very life of God into our lives. We will never be sorry for coming to Christ and being saved. Nothing is more important than knowing whether or not you're saved, knowing where you're going to spend eternity, knowing whether or not you've got the peace of God in your heart. What could be greater than that? Amen. To know whether or not you're abiding in the vine. Yes. There's just nothing greater than that, of course. And that's why we're encouraging folks to cultivate this great friendship as we read already. He says, henceforth I call you not servants, verse number 15. I read verse 13, then he said, verse 14, you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. So this is how we can tell about the friendship is it whether or not you obey me. He says, henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you should ask of my Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you that you love one another. Brethren, you know, maybe that instead of these things being so hard to understand, maybe they're not hard to understand at all. Maybe it's just because of what he's actually saying while we struggle with it. Because he said, look here, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you're going to be my friend, you're going to do what it is I tell you to do. Amen. I mean, oh, really, you got to have help to misunderstand it. Sometimes we've got a good bit of help. <laughs> I mean, on misunderstanding. But well, we ought to just get it back down to what he said and just let the, what he said stand in our hearts and minds 
And brethren, we're going to have our hearts to agree with what he said. Amen. Well, uh, so many wonderful thoughts here. So many different things you can think on, different directions you could go in the teaching of it. But certainly, brethren, this idea of friendship is something we ought to follow up on. Amen. And of course, we have several different examples in the Bible. And the Lord Jesus dealt with betrayal, of course, there in the book of John. We talked about it already, how the Judas betrayed him and said he was supposed to be a friend. But he lifted up his heel against me. Even a devoted friend might fail you in a time of great need. You never know. How many know that uh, when it comes to friends here on this earth, people can be awful good to us, of course, when we have wonderful fellowship and friendship, but even a friend could fail you. And uh, you remember Peter, James, and John? Uh, they went to sleep in the garden. And then Peter denied the Lord three times. These are the people that the Lord said, uh, you know, you're my friends. He said, I won't call you slaves anymore, <laughs> even though they are. <laughs> he said, I'm going to talk to you as friends. But yet, uh, they come up, you know, short in, in many ways. In St. John 3.29, he said, He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. So he said, the best man, he's the friend of the bridegroom. He said, it's as if you are the best man. <laughs> Glory to God. I mean, oh, brethren, we occupy a tremendous position in the kingdom of God. Just like the, the best man at a wedding, he's got a serious role. He's got to watch over that bridegroom and help everything come together at the right time. Here we are, brethren, with a tremendous responsibility. We have the privilege of knowing his will, but then we have a responsibility of carrying out his will. Amen. And so it's time for believers to have some maturity. We're going to have to see some growth. We're coming down toward the end. It looks like everything that you could think of is that uh, this has got to be toward the end. You know, everything is lining up. Things are moving quickly. Did you know just a little short time back ago that uh, you would not have seen Iran and Russia moving together the way they are right now? It wasn't that long ago that there wasn't that much connection between those two nations. But then the Bible says there in the book of Ezekiel that... Uh, there will be Iran, it says Persia, which is modern day Iran and Iraq, says Iran, and it says the house of Tagarma, and of all of his bands, it names some of the others there, that looks like tribes out of the Russian area, that both of those will come against Israel. Yeah. Did you know it's in there? It's in there just like that. We call it the Battle of Gog and Magog. Yeah. Finally, it's a battle so, uh, so uh, cataclysmic, that it takes seven months to bury the dead and seven years to clean up the debris. I mean, that's a pretty big battle. Amen. <laughs> in the world we live in now. But here we see all that lining up. I, you know, I'm not prophesying these things, how they're going to happen or whatever. But there was just, just a few months ago, just a, a year or two at the very most probably, that uh, if you go back in time, look back how well the relationships been, they weren't that close together. Now because of these wars, They've been pushed in together. Now they're they're working together on some things. Yeah. And so it looks like to us it's all lining up perfectly, just like the scripture says. We're coming down toward the end. Amen. Amen. The bridegroom is going to come back for the bride. Yeah. And every one of us as Christians, we serve, of course, as a member of the of the body of Christ and the bride of Christ, but also we serve uh, in this position as the best man. We have a responsibility to obey God, honor the Lord. Amen. One of the greatest, most renowned teachings in the Bible about friendship with God, of course, would have to be Abraham. And you can study it on your own. We won't have time to go into it in great detail tonight. But Genesis 18 talks about how that uh, Abraham received the Lord and two of the angels who came to visit him on his way while God and the angels were on their way to investigate the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. We remember Abraham received them into his house. He's nearly a hundred years old. But uh, he foregoes his noonday uh, nap. He doesn't take that nap. And then he greets the visitors, the Lord, the two angels are come, sought of the comfort, fed them a lovely meal. The Bible says he also hastened and ran and encouraged the others to go ahead and perform their work quickly. I mean, there's not many hundred-year-old people you see doing a lot of running around. And hastening, the Bible says he hastened and ran around. 
Not only that, when I looked up the word for servant, even for Abraham back there, did you know even in the Old Testament Hebrew, it said slave. Yep. Hello. <laughs> well, you see, we've just, we've had this thing masked over. It has been a cover up. I have to Man. agree with that pastor that I, I heard teach this. I said, you know, I believe he's got something there. I think the enemy's done everything he can to obscure what type of relationship we're supposed to be having with the Lord. Amen. And what our level of commitment ought to be. Instead of us just getting what we can out of him when we want to, and then we fly off the handle for a while, and we're, we're just doing whatever, and then things get bad enough, we, well, well, I guess I better pray. <laughs> we pray a little bit, get back in fellowship with God a little bit, and get blessed a little bit, and then we're back off again out there, wandering around doing whatever. That wasn't the, that wasn't the plan. <laughs> Amen. That wasn't what God intended. He intended us to have a closer walk with him, and real fellowship with God. Amen. Instead of going back and forth and back and forth like that to polar extremes, we're supposed to be having more of a relationship with God like Abraham. Yeah. Abraham is an Old Testament saint. I mean, whatever an Old Testament saint had, uh, there was just a, uh, something that prefigured the kind of relationship you and I are supposed to have with God. Yeah. If, if Abraham was the friend of God in the Old Testament, what should we be as new covenant believers? Amen. Yeah. When we have a better covenant, it suffers upon better promises. We've just let the devil steal from us in many ways. Did you know Abraham stood by? He didn't eat with them. While he's having the food served to them, he stands by like a true servant slave. <laughs> he stood nearby to do whatever needed to be done. Then in the last half of the chapter, there's a little different type of environment and, and type of atmosphere that's there. Uh, Abraham is just standing still, quietly, communing with the Lord. And then the Lord says, shall I hide from Abraham that which I do? In other words, Abraham's going to be in the inner circle. He's going to know things that other people don't know. I'm just going to pull him right in to what it is I'm going to do in regard to Sodom and Gomorrah. And actually, of course, he, he allowed Abraham to plead the case for Sodom and Gomorrah. And he come all the way down, you know, to, to ten souls. He'd find ten righteous souls. And I believe if Abraham said, if he would just spare it for Lot's sake, I believe God would have spared it. But Abraham didn't go any further. I guess he thought there's got to be at least 10 people there. I mean, brother, it's awful easy to overestimate what kind of shape the world's in. A lot of times you won't think it's in better shape than what it's in. And it might have been Abraham's situation there. He's thinking there's got to be at least 10 people in Sodom and Gomorrah. But evidently it wasn't even 10. Amen. That's right. Are you out there? <laughs> And that's what I want to do. I want to see the best in folks. I want to find some redeeming quality about political parties. I want to think to myself, well, at least they, they this or they that, and then finally get the place where you just can't find any redeeming qualities. <laughs> Not one thing. You think, you know, I'd like to be able to find something. This is kind of the American way to find some kind of silver lining, find something about it you think's good. But just like God said to Jonah, you know, concerning Nineveh, said there's a whole group of people over here in Nineveh, a whole city, that they don't know what they're, they don't know their left hand from their right. In other words, when it comes to spiritual things, they're just incredibly ignorant. And we want to know that's the kind of world we're in. Amen. And that's why I'd be a whole lot rather to be a friend of God than a friend of the world. I mean, a friendship with the world is going to destroy people. Yeah. And of course, I'm talking about that godless world system. I didn't, I'm not saying you can't be friends with individuals out here or be able to talk with other people. And, and be gracious, of course, to uh, both Christians and non-Christians. But you know what I mean, that when you're catering to and bowing down to this world system, allowing this world system to override your thinking, override what you know to be true in the Bible, that's going to be costly. Amen. You become the enemy of God. I tell you, no matter what else happens, I just do not want to be an enemy of God. Amen. And the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, is teaching us about the love of God. He's the right one to do so because ultimately he dies for his friends and his enemies. No greater love than a man hath than this than to lay his life down for his friends. But Romans 5.10 tells us he also died for us while we were his enemies. So Christ ultimately died for both his friends and his enemies. Yeah. Could we stop and have a 21-day camp meeting? Glory to God. That blesses our heart to know what our God has been willing to do. Brethren, he is our master. He is our friend. We see it in Abraham. 
God says concerning Abraham, verse 19, Genesis 18, he says, For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which is spoken of him. God's already told Abraham, you're going to be a, a great nation. Nations are going to come out of thee. He's told them you're going to be blessed, of course. Your seed's going to number more than the stars of heaven and sand on the seashore. A lot of different ideas have been set forth about the sand and the stars, if that represents the natural people that came out of his loins, and then the stars of heaven, the spiritual, or that all of us that are children of faith, uh, we would be considered the children of Abraham as well. Uh, whether or not that's a valid teaching completely, you'll have to judge for yourself, but that's why some people have given it. But the message is here, but being he was the friend of God, God could say about Abraham, I know what Abraham's going to do. I know what kind of man he is. Well, I tell you what, when you get God testifying for you, uh, you're, you're headed in the right direction. It's never, when the Lord says, I know what Abraham's going to do. Hallelujah. There was that kind of intimacy. and There was that kind of uh, great friendship and fellowship with God. Uh, Lot didn't have that. Lot wasn't the, uh, the friend of God the way that Abraham was. Lot was a good man, a righteous man, but he became vexed, you know, by the filthy conversation of the wicked and in some ways loved the world. And they cost him immeasurably. Yeah. Isn't that right? Amen. And there are some folks, you know, that they're going to make it to heaven, but they're, they're going to suffer a lot of the consequences that come from forgiving sin because they, God did forgive them. God preserved their lives, but they have allowed a lot of things to happen that would have never happen had they sought out friendship with God and fellowship with the Lord. Amen. Amen. Aren't you glad tonight, brethren, that you and I can have this wonderful relationship with God and really there's nothing else that's going to matter when you come down the end of the way? I mean, the only thing that's really going to matter is your fellowship and friendship with Almighty God. Amen. Isn't that true? And so we want to draw our strength from Him from the meantime because there's coming a time when that's all we're going to be able to have anyway. We want to honor him and bless his name. We'll pray tonight and believe God as we dismiss this evening and uh, do our very best, of course, to live this life. And I admit it is very challenging to say the least, but thank God the more we know about the Bible, the word of God, the more help we'll get. Amen. Amen. Our Father, we thank you for this privilege we have to be able to come before you this way. We honor your holy word. We thank you, Father God, for what it means to us. And we thank you, Father, for the fellowship and the friendship we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, help us to grow in that, Father. May there be wonderful conversions come out of this, Father, as we continue to honor your name. And Father, we pray for these precious ones that have gathered here and those that may be watching, God, that you will bless and strengthen them mightily as we pray down in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much.